Okay, Lori Daniels, thank you for being willing to be interviewed. Um, my first question is just if you could say a bit about your own background and how you came to this work and maybe combine with that a bit of the population that you work with. And, and then I guess segueing into that about how these lovely slides relate to that. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of your your educational endeavor here. Um, I'm Lori Daniels and I have a PhD in social work. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Oregon, as well as a licensed clinical social worker in Hawaii. Um, I am an associate professor of social work at Hawaii Pacific University and the master's of social work chair. Um, I also have a master's of social work degree that I got from University of Chicago, as well as a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Mary Washington. Um, I, I would answer your question, uh, Peter, more so like it feels like this work found me versus me seeking it out. Um, and I feel very fortunate that that's how it worked. Um, so when I was a brand new MSW uh, back in the late 1980s, I um, really was attracted to anything having to do with dreams and nightmares. And so I took a class on dreams. And then uh, my first job was with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, as a social worker in the addictions program, and then two years later, right next door at this residential post-traumatic stress treatment program, I got hired as, um, as one of the counselors there. Mm. And in doing so, it was a really intensive program working with war-traumatized Vietnam vets mostly. Some Korean War vets and some World War II vets were still in the treatment program too, but mostly it was these younger Vietnam vets. And we would have group therapy every single day. And one of the groups that we would have was focused on nightmares because that's one of the predominant hallmark symptoms of PTSD is recurrent traumatically based nightmares. Mm -hmm. And so we would be doing writing during our group sessions that were like an hour and a half. And um, that takes a lot of time to get the writing up. And then, but people would be processing through some of the stuck issues that were driving this nightmare to continue to be manifested and disruptive to people's sleep. And then we had a guest speaker come in one day to our program. Um, she was actually training our staff on this thing called sand tray and sand play. And she brought in these boxes and a few figurines. And lo and behold, we were introduced to sand tray as an intervention. And because I was already a co-facilitator of group therapy working on nightmares, to me, it made total sense that we would translate this particular medium into our DreamWork groups. And so that's what I did. So we invested in getting a sand play set up, got the trays, got the sand, um, always had it in the corner of the group room. And then we just started utilizing it in addition to the writing. Uh, mm -hmm. We would do some degree of that, but it became kind of the, a shortcut way of actually visualizing and seeing what somebody's nightmare looked like Instead of us having to imagine what it looked like, we got to visually see what the nightmare was. And so, but it also reduced the nightmare into this confined space, right. which meant the dreamer was no longer overwhelmed by being surrounded by these horrible images, but now it's reduced to this like manageable space, right. um, which, you know, obviously can start containing the issue. And then um, another advantage of using the sand tray with the nightmares was that we could then have the facility, uh, the uh, protagonist move the items around and be able to ask questions about particular things as they were kind of lined up in the tray, but then also do like a replacement of things as we were intervening with the nightmare. So it became not just a way of assessing what was going on more in line with what the dreamer was experiencing, but also to a reduced manageable uh, size and then could actually intervene right then and there using the figures and the sand and everything like that. So it's super, super powerful, really, really powerful uh, because you have this visual and, and then we actually could uh, photograph how, what the, happened at the intervention and then provide back then Polaroids uh, to the, the person who presented the nightmare so they could have a visual, a new visual, a corrective experience, so to speak, of the nightmare using this medium. Can I ask so, a question about that? I'm sorry? Sorry to interrupt. So um, 
that's really helpful. So you're externalizing the dream and containing it and then being able to manipulate it. And so how was it to get men to work with sand and toys as opposed to- <laughs> Really good question. Yeah, um, clearly as one would anticipate, there was some degree of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I've, but I've used this medium for, for a long time, about 20 years. And most of the people, most of my clients have been ma male. Mm -hmm. And especially in my early years, most of my clients were male. So yeah, of course, there would be some degree of resistance. So the way that I would facilitate kind of lowering those defenses would be, I would always give them the option to use the writing instead of the sand. Mm -hmm. But we also do in our groups uh, check-in. And the check-in is based upon emotions. And so I would have them check into group, no matter, everybody would check into group and they would have to go to the shelves and identify a figurine that would best represent their emotional state. Mm. And so by doing that, you get them to sort of, it's kind of like a, this warm introduction. So they get their hands on the figures. Right. It, uh, it, they understand that if they're picking out something that represents how their internal state is, but they have this representative, then they check in saying, I chose this because right now emotionally I'm feeling, and then they would identify the feelings and they would often look at it um, and kind of like pay attention to it a little bit more. So it began to help them integrate a little bit more about what this is about. And sometimes people would pick out two figures and they'd say, well, I'm kind of conflicted. So I'm, I picked out two and then they, <laughs> and so by getting men to do that, um, it was a kind of a, a less threatening way of having them see this as toys. Right. I mean, most certainly in the middle of a very tense part of a session, those defenses will come up, especially as we start kind of honing in on the underlying issue mm. and the stuck emotional place. And so I have run into people saying, this is just toys. What is this? But, um, but then I, I converse with them in such a way where I, I actually say, well, this, is, this may be toys in front of us, but what we're talking about is, is not play. Right. And so, and so, um, so there's a way to finesse that right. and try to get people to, to just sort of come down from the resistance and usually it only takes one client, one male client, um, to actually use the tray mm -hmm. in, uh, in, uh, in a session as, as the medium of discussing issues mm -hmm. to actually break the rest of the group out of their resistance. Do you think you being a woman helped or made it more challenging? Yes and yes. <laughs> And the way, and the way, why I say yes to both is because it really depends on the experiences of the veterans with females before him. Right. And so, uh, of course, uh, as I was, I'm younger than Vietnam vets. And so my clients, especially as I was developing my practice, uh, are 20 years at least older than me. So mm -hmm. clearly seeing a young female, in such an intensive environment and doing heavy duty tr treatment with them was not, not their first choice. Right. And so I, I clearly ran into um, several situations, not all the time, but at times I would. And so it be, it would become challenging because it was as if I don't have the credentials because I'm not a veteran either. Oh, I've right. never been in a war zone. And so, so I had to work through my credibility with my clients and um, I tell my graduate students that you have to figure out what you're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. When you find out, I mean, because ev your willingness to listen and help is, is something that you can add to that list. Mm -hmm. That's what you bring to the table. But you also probably have known how to have healthier relationships. Um, you have potentially better sleep than people. I mean, so, there are things that we have practiced in our own lives that at least the clients may need, but you may not ostensibly look like the right person, right? But, um, but it's, like, it's like how they say, you know, I know how to drive a car, but I don't know how to fix it. But, or, um, 
does every oncologist need to have had cancer to be able to treat cancer, right? right? And, so, and so it's really thinking about what do I, what do I bring to my rapport in rapport building with my clients. And so I had to sit down and figure that out. And at times I had to do like a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, after you're in this business for a while, you don't have to do the sales pitch because the fact that I'm still employed there and enthusiastically wanting to help um, actually quickly dissipates that, that, um, that resistance. So, and then there's times when, especially when it comes to people who've been sexually violated, um, male clients will actually oftentimes, more often than not, say that they'd prefer to be treated by a woman. Mm -hmm. And part of that you can probably speak to in your, in your own uh, expertise, Peter, about, about how um, the um, societal messages about males being the protectors and they protect females and they're stronger and they should have all of these capabilities um, to be able to defend themselves. And so when those things arise, having a male therapist becomes a little bit more challenging for male rape survivors. And so it happened to be, that was the one time in the one you know pocket of time I was working as a clinician where being a female was actually more advantageous than not. But with war trauma survivors, it just depends, right? So I worked a lot with Vietnam vets. Most of Vietnam veterans are male. There are obviously females there too. And I've worked with female Vietnam vets too. But, um, but a lot of the male clients didn't want to work with a female, but I still worked with them anyway. Right. Because when you demonstrate genuineness and caring, but also um, knowledge and experience, um, I often would kind of front load my introduction to me with some of that, um, that those credentials. Sure. And I think it's also how they experience me. Sure. Like, like I'm talking to you right now. I, like, I talk to my clients the same way. I mean, it's like, sort of like, I'm, I'm here. I'm here 100%, right? And so uh, I think that kind of attentiveness coupled with genuineness mm -hmm. and a commitment to helping somebody, that in and of itself is a really good credential to have. And Remember, then there's the knowledge and awareness and experience uh, that tell helps. Tell us what you bring in terms of knowledge and experience and strategies that are reflected in these sand tray scenes. Yeah, so I wanted to share with you some of these. These are actually quite old because they come from slides that I took of my client's work. Hmm. And, um, and I recognize actually the trays is coming from when I was the, um, I was actually the team leader for the traumatic stress recovery program for the Honolulu VA medical mm -hmm. center. And so I brought sand tray into our program and then we use it with my clients. So um, these are sequential. The two on the top are sequential with each other and the three on the bottom are sequential with each other. So this is again, work with Vietnam veterans who are having recurrent traumatically based nightmares, uh, pretty well close to actual event nightmares. Um, on the upper left, and it looks kind of orange around the framing, um, it, I wrote underneath, he is death. And so, so I don't remember all of the nightmares that I work with, but I pretty well can conjecture that at one point uh, on the left, you can see the larger soldier figure um, that is probably representative of the overwhelming enemy that came. And, um, and then you could see a figure of a young female there. I mean, she was probably uh, killed in an incident that the, that the client is nightmaring about and feeling as if he didn't do enough. And perhaps if you look to the right, what looks like a red frame around it, you can see that the, that the, the female figure, the girl is, is, is dead. She's down on the ground and the death figure has been replaced by a knight in shining armor of sorts. Mm. And so, um, so what I'm, I'm pretty well indicating here is, is actually that he really cared. He really cared about her and what happened to her and that he was not in a situation to be able to prevent what happened to her, 
but he was in a situation to connect with her on an emotional level and genuinely care about her. So what happens in these replacements, and it, by, by the way, it probably took 20 minutes to get from slide, the slide on the left to the slide to the right, mm -hmm. in terms of conversing and dialoguing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we need to do is in some ways facilitate a cognitive corrective experience. So it's like cognitive processing, but it's not the same as cognitive processing in terms of um, how it occurs. But we do want to think about, or I know that I was probably thinking about, how can I get a veteran to get from punishing himself for feeling as if he hurt somebody or killed somebody, and therefore he is death, and, and tap into the part of him that, that genuinely cared about this situation and cared about what happened to somebody else. That doesn't come from a cold-hearted killer. That comes from a place of compassion. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted him to replace the figure of death. And all I did was, by the way, it's a completely open-ended question. I said, I usually borrow something of what somebody has said and say, what represents that part of you that actually cared and was compassionate to what happened to her? And that's when oftentimes a client will go up to the shelves and find still resonating from what they're feeling, the part of them that's compassionate, and then they switch it. And then we now have given a, a visual and bring literally externalize once again, uh, the part of them that actually was traumatized. And then we can work with that. Lovely. Yeah. So not unsimilar. The three on the bottom are actually the same sand tray over uh, the work that a client did with me. And by the way, I never touch any of the figurines because this is their space. Mm -hmm. So I can gesture above the figures, but I do not physically touch the figures. Mm -hmm. But it looks like if I could recall, and again, I have done a lot of this work, so I'm not going to remember everything. But on the far left, um, that I believe the client is actually the figure in the red shirt and the yellow trousers um, trying to protect some space. And so his nightmare is about probably people with whom he's harmed in the past coming into his, his um, safe space, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so he showed this and he probably identified most of the people and so, uh, so he represented those people and then he's attempting to, to protect his safe space. So going to the second one over, um, you can see that he, he really sees death near the very end. Death is coming towards him and he is, is not working, it's not working, right? And so oftentimes people with recurrent nightmares will wake up when, when things get emotionally charged up. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, probably what happened in this session was that we had a long conversation about what the death part really represented. And we actually,